Today, a story about identity theft has reached the headlines across Australia. Identity thieves have been targeting units and homes in Sydney's suburbs. For two years, one identity thief stole letters from letterboxes and from bins, including electricity bills and other documents, a Medicare card and a driver's licence posted in the mail. Through information from the documents, the identity thief made a new identity and with it opened up a post office box. Drugs were delivered into the post office box and this is linked to an international drug syndicate. We believe this recent stolen identity could be yours. Identity thieves could be targeting you. One in five people in Australia are affected by identity theft and online fraud, which costing you, the taxpayer, $2.2 billion. About one in five Australians have been targeted and have been the victim of identity fraud. And it equates to one Australian every 20 seconds being defrauded. Unlike other crimes where they target people with a lot of money, this is the type of crimes where your identification is the valuable source, the valuable part of it. Everybody can be a target or a victim of identity fraud. I think it's one of those crimes that people think won't happen to them, definitely. And I, I think people aren't aware of the seriousness of the consequences of have having your mail stolen and then losing your identity. People that are elderly, people that haven't got a great grasp of English. We see people that aren't in the community for very long and people of various ethnic and cultural backgrounds that are targeted quite easily in this type of fraud because their identification is the actual valuable commodity that the crooks are trying to obtain. We need 100 points of identity information to open a bank account and passports and driver's licences that have photographs of you and are linked to government databases are the most valuable. The Australian passport uh, will sell for say $20,000 online. Fraudsters are essentially doing this as a full-time job. They're really good at obtaining the information, they're really good at getting other people to go and steal the mail, and they're really good at putting together packages on particular names and particular identities so that they can live the high life on other people's money and on other people's loss. Our most recent investigations have involved mail theft, where we see a group of people that were part of a syndicate go to places rich in mailboxes. So it might be unit blocks, it might be apartment buildings, or it might just be a street with a lot of open mailboxes. From there they steal the mail and within that mail they find the identities and they're able to create a profile on that particular person. So for example, one matter that's already been before the courts, we found that the gentleman was obtaining a number of different identities. He was then opening post office boxes. With that post office box, he was then importing drugs. So by the time we came to arrest him, he'd not only created the false identity documents, the passports, but he'd also imported a great deal of narcotics into Australia using that identity. Driver's licence is like gold to someone involved in mailbox theft and identity theft because that's like 80 points toward the 100 you require to get enough points to assume somebody else's identity. We have heard stories about people having their, uh, their identity stolen and people actually cashing in other people's superannuations uh, without the knowledge of the actual person whose name it really is. Somebody can be aware that someone's going up traveling and they can then use that time to assume your identity because while you're away, that's a great time to assume someone else's identity. So in December 2016, I went to Europe with my mother. Going from London to Paris on the train, the mobile stopped working, the internet stopped working. And I thought, okay, it probably is something to do with changing countries. Then I started seeing how I ran out of money from my one of my account, my credit card first. Then I went and checked and there were lots of transactions that were not mine. Basically what happened is someone broke into my mailbox, uh, took my Vodafone bill, then they called Vodafone with the phone that appears on the bill uh, and then tried different uh, alterations of my birth date uh, so a mix of the numbers of my birth date and then they got it then they moved the SIM card so the connection of the telephone 
of the mobile phone was moved to another SIM card that they had. Then they rehabilitated a PayPal account that I hadn't used in 10 years. Then they activated that, and through that they started siphoning money. My United Airlines frequent flight, all, all my miles got stolen. Then I called my, um, uh, my mortgage, and I just had a feeling I need to call now. And I called and I, and I said, look, my identity has been stolen. I would like to cancel everything and put everything on hold. And they went, oh, but you just called to change your password. So they knew my account details. They tried to change it through the phone. They called. They pretended to be me. Uh, they managed to change the password. And within five minutes, they took $50,000 out of my a home loan, then the money got, just got re refunded by the bank. But say if you don't know that your identity has been hacked and someone puts a loan in your name and you're not like, and you're kind of older, it might take all your savings to fight it back. And, um, and, uh, and it's, to, it's to prove that it wasn't you, to prove those things are the scary things. So the identity theft definitely changed me. I am constantly checking that all my accounts, all the, the things that come out of my accounts are legitimate. I'm constantly changing my passwords. I am very aware of where my bills go. So if a bill doesn't arrive, I, I have a, you know, like I call them straight away. I, um, I moved everything to my PO box. We have heard horrific stories of people losing their life savings through losing their identity. I don't like that people are targeted and I don't like that they're made victims when they've really done nothing wrong and I don't like that there's a group of people who steal your identification, create these false accounts and make you a victim. Um, I think it's really wrong and I, I think it's unfair and especially to target the most vulnerable in our community is um, a really weak act. Criminals will go through rubbish bins and extract important documents and then use them to compile this dossier of information about you. So shred them. Um, you can buy a shredder in the newsagent for a small amount of money. Um, that's an important thing to do or just secure them at home in some way, lock them in a filing cabinet uh, so that they're not just floating around if someone breaks into your house. For example, picking up something from the post office rather than having it delivered to your mailbox. Um, obviously that's a pretty straightforward way of reducing mailbox theft and subsequent identity theft. Talk to your body corporate or your strata group about how you might be able to retrofit your existing mailboxes into perhaps the lobby area of your apartment. Because this type of crime is very common in apartment dwellings, so often we see banks of letterboxes positioned on foot outside on footpaths, outside common entry points to apartments. And what we do know is that the locks on many of those uh, letterboxes are all the same. So your key as your tenant to your individual letterbox, there's a good chance it will open every other letterbox in your complex as well. So you can put uh, what's called a non-master key lock on your individual letterbox. So call a locksmith, get them to come in and put a specific lock. If everyone tomorrow locked their mailboxes, there would be a massive impact. It would make life very difficult for these fraudsters who steal your identity. Have you been waiting for something in the mail that hasn't turned up? Do you have an unlocked mailbox? Have you given out your personal information over the phone, like your birth date, middle name, and other information to people and organisations you do not know? 
Do you forget to use your passwords on your devices? Once someone steals your identity or steals from your bank accounts, it could take weeks, months and years to recover and to prove you weren't involved. Some people have lost entire life savings, their superannuation and been involved unintentionally in crime. It has led to catastrophic consequences because of a scam intended and designed by professionals to scam you. Designed to make them rich. Be aware of scams. Your identity is your life. Don't give out your personal information. If something doesn't sound right, hang up the phone and call the organisation directly. Use passwords, lock your mailbox and be safe from scams. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Your identity is worth money to criminals. It's got a value. And that value means that they can get credit and loans in your name, they can commit crimes in your name, they can uh, facilitate organised crime in your name. The main issue why people get hacked and they will never be realising that this is happening is due to the lack of awareness then uh, people are not paying too much attention, that they think that this will never happen to me. My colleague Dr. Jun Sang Baek will show how easy this kind of uh, hacking activity can be done towards a victim who really doesn't know what, the, what she is doing. A victim will be invited to uh, view an attachment. So there is an attachment that is sent via email and this attachment may be coming from a friend, so a hacker has been sending an email on behalf of somebody else, so that the victim will feel that, yes, this is a legitimate email, it has an attachment. So you've got this photo from your friends, and you click yes, and open. All right, so now you can drag and drop this file on your desktop, and now, Double click on it, okay, you see the photo, but you've been hacked. What? The victim will try to open the attachment. Once the attachment is open, in this demonstration, we will show that actually it's like a legitimate attachment, which is a picture. So from a person, an honest person point of view, everything actually looks normal. However, what has happened, in fact, this is what we call reverse TCP connection. So what happened is basically the victim is initializing a connection to the hacker's machine. So from then on, the hacker can take control of the victim's machine. When I say taking control, it means that the hacker will be able to view everything that is inside the victim's machine as long as the machine is turned on and then the hacker can download everything inside that machine including all the confidential file and from then the hacker can just retrieve and build profile of this victim and actually this can be done really quite easily. Emails are phrased um, and the sequence of um, information that's sought from you um, how it's targeted, that's all uh, predictable and criminals are, are, are now have the strategies and knowledge to know how to target people in the best possible way to win them over. People go straight from a, an email to a website without actually checking what it is and knowing what the correct URL is, you know, whether it is a legitimate government department that um, you're being taken to. And often the the um, website that you're taking to will be completely fictitious. So one example are scammers that pretend to be the tax office. And they'll try and scare people by calling them and saying, we've, we've looked into you and we've noticed you haven't paid taxes, so you owe us money. And if you don't pay us money now, the police will come over and arrest you this afternoon. And so when someone's told that, immediately they're, they're concerned and they're not thinking straight and they're, they're just reacting to what the scammers want them to do. And the scammers want them in that place. They want them not even to think about what's happening. And so they'll convince these people to go down to the local store and buy gift vouchers as some form of repayment of these taxes that are owed. And for most of us, when we're not involved in that discussion, we'll think, how, how can someone do that? 
that doesn't make any sense. But when you're in that moment, when you've been scared, when you're, you're being told that you're about to go to jail, if you don't do this, then people, people are in a position where they're not logically or rationally thinking, they're not thinking through things. And that's exactly what scammers want. They want you panicked. The second type of scam uh, are scams where uh, the, the individual may be convinced that they've got some type of virus on their computer. They'll say you've got a virus and you need to call this number immediately. And if you don't call this number, your computer will stop working. You know, or, or you might be unlucky enough that you're actually waiting for a phone call from a company and the scammer rings you and impersonates that company. And we've had a lot of those cases where it's just coincidence that they're waiting for a phone call to come in from a, a big company like Microsoft or like Telstra. But the scammers have jumped in and called them just, just by some type of fluke. And they've convinced them to then provide access to their, their device. I received a telephone call saying this is an Australian tax agent office to and I said, yes, what can I do for you? They said, you haven't answered our mail, ask and paying your uh, uh, arrear, uh, uh, monies that is owing, in, which is in arrears. And I said, well, I wasn't aware of that. And I did continue the conversation for a few minutes until they said that they would send somebody around to collect it from my uh, house, because it was stress to think that I had, I might end up in jail for not paying my tax, um, which was what they were really telling me, that I would go to jail if I didn't pay the tax, pay the money. So it was really a very nasty phone call. And it really doesn't matter how intelligent we are, because intelligence is really no defense against these scams. So where, where a criminal can send you into a space of fear and panic, through the language that they use. So if ever they're using, you've been hacked, or money's been taken from your account, or you're about to get arrested through tax evasion, all of those sort of, all of that scripting that the criminal pitches to a victim will have the victim going into a threat response. So it's a very evolutionary process. You can't help it. Hello? What? It's the whole thing of, you know, government is, is it, and you must respond. You know, you have an obligation to respond, and that's not true. You say, oh, okay, really, I'll call you back. You put the phone down, you source your own number for the tax office, you ring them and say, is there a problem here? So you're always basically verifying the legitimacy of a caller. How do I protect my identity? I'm careful about who I share it with. I know, I know how much my identity is worth to criminals. And I don't want to be responsible for helping a drug cartel or some overseas organised crime group make money in my name and put me in front of what they're doing as an organisation that's wrong. So I'm, I, I'm very mindful of how I share my information, who I share my information with, where I keep my information what type of um, antivirus and protection measures I have on my devices when I'm online, what, how I keep my mail safe, where I keep my documents. Break the communication between the criminal and you by introducing others and asking them, does this, does this seem right to you? Does this seem okay? Should I do this? Um, be, be bothered enough to find out the real number to call. Often it's um, good to take time before you engage in transactions. We're often tempted in the community to really do things instantaneously, respond to emails straight away, buy things online very quickly. But if you put a bit of time into knowing who you're dealing with and thinking about what the vulnerabilities might be before you actually do a, an online transaction, then you'll probably protect yourself. Use secure passwords, don't use ones that can be guessed easily. If someone calls you and they ask you to prove who you are by giving away your 
tax file number or your Centrelink number or your credit card details. End the call, make your own inquiries, ask a friend or a family member what the number is to call the tax office or what the number is to call Telstra and then make that phone call. Don't, don't react. That's what scammers want you to do. So stop, take a breath, think, end the call, say thanks very much, I'll look into it, talk to a family member or friend and then call the real number and feel comfortable because you have called the real number that you can prove who you are and share that information. How do we combat this? We need to work together. We need to work as a network. It starts at the home. It starts with me looking out for my mother or my father. For seniors in our community and for families of, of senior members in our community, uh, talk. Don't, don't, don't feel as though that you have to somehow work it all out yourself. These criminals don't want us to talk. These criminals want us to feel ashamed. And these criminals want us to just keep at it ourselves. How we defeat them is we defeat them by talking about them talking to our family and saying, I got this phone call or I've got this email or I think I responded to something but I'm not sure. With the increase in mailbox fraud and online identity theft, I do have some advice for you. If you have a mailbox, lock it. When you receive government documents or anything with your personal information in it, shred it or destroy it when you're finished or keep it safe and ensure you have passwords for all your devices. If people call you and you don't know them, get their name. Tell them you'll call them back and call the organisation directly. Ignore any emails, texts or messages on social media that ask you to give them money or tell you you'll receive money. If something doesn't seem right, ask a friend or someone you trust what they think. Be aware and remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true.